Good morning. Uh, I'm going to do this in English so everyone can understand. I hope that's okay. And the talk today is called the Open Source Surprise. It's basically why I believe not everyone is doing open source. And uh, I'm Benjamin. So, a little bit about myself. This is Bimper, my dog. Uh, he's dressed in a bee, uh, like SAB in this, this picture. It's lovely. Uh, this is me and my wife. Uh, last week, we did a track called the West Highland Way. It's a beautiful track in Scotland. And we've been married for 12 years, which is amazing. Uh, I work at PF5, which do cool things. Uh, I teach high school in Makshimim, which I'll actually talk about a bit later. And I do open source. So I am a team member in Node.js, which you might have heard of, uh, Cylon.js, that's a testing library, uh, Mobex, Bluebird, and a bunch of other libraries. So uh, I want to start with a quick, quick disclaimer. This is about dev culture uh, in open source, and it's my personal opinion. You might have had a different experience. You might have a different experience. I am one person. This does not apply to everyone. So the talk today is going to be about three things. It's going to be about fear. It's going to be about open source. And it's going to be about self-efficacy. And we're going to go over these things and try to get a better understanding of all of them and how they are interrelated. So what is fear? Basically, fear is an emotion we feel that, like, it, it's when we sense danger. When something is dangerous, we become fearful of it. When we anticipate danger, uh, we start feeling fear. And I, I want to say this, like, to start with it and say it, ver like, out loud. We have a culture problem in the development industry. We start, uh, whenever a new technology is out, we start by calling it stupid or calling it bad, even before we try it. Like, it's very common to have a new library come out and then to have five people telling you why the library is stupid and why it doesn't work. And that's very common in some of the communities I've been in. And it makes a lot of sense because the web development stack, and it's also true from some other fields, changes very often. It's very common to see a library like emerge and you get to know the library and you build a community and I think like a good example uh, is Angular 1 uh, where you build a community and then suddenly it, it starts losing popularity and it's very scary because everything is changing around us and we don't know if, if the skill set we have for example for web development will be relevant in five years because the way we're doing backend changes, the way we're doing frontend changes uh, and the technology changes and that can get really scary and the paradigm itself changes. So you get people saying, uh, IoT is the future of development. And then you have other people telling you that, is IoT dead? And you have very strong, very conflicting opinions that you're constantly exposed to uh, in our culture. We have a culture uh, where we shame people. And we are very defensive. So for example, someone would tell you, hey, I'm doing Java at work, or I'm doing C++. And you'd have five people telling them, that's wrong. You shouldn't do Java, you should do, I don't know, Kotlin, for example. So we have a culture where we really like shaming people. We like telling people that the technology that they use is inadequate. And I I'm not talking about the technical arguments. I'm not talking about the people telling you, hey, maybe consider Kotlin because it has better anonymous functions. I'm talking about the people who will tell you, if you're doing Java, you will be relevant in four or five years. If you're doing Angular, you will be relevant in four or five years. And that's a really scary thing like to hear and it's a really scary thing to say too because none of us know Th that, that's the sad fact we don't know if angular will be popular in five years we don't know if java will be popular in five years and we judge things we don't know harshly so someone would go to a facebook group or a meetup and they tell you hey i learned this new cool library called i don't know rxjs and you tell and people will tell them rxjs is stupid and what people will often hear is, if you do RxJS, you're stupid. And that's a very negative message to give developers. And it's very common and pervasive in internet culture. I see this in forums I participate in all the time. You, you have people, one of the avenues, I, like one of the communities I participate in is Stack Overflow. And Stack Overflow has a chat. And people will come into the chat and they say, hey, I'm learning jQuery. And like five people will come and tell them, hey, jQuery is dead. And that's not what you want to hear when you're learning a new technology. That drives people away from the community, and it's very scary. 
and we call people directly stupid. Just last week in JavaScript Israel, which is one of the biggest groups, someone came and says and said like, "Hey, I'm learning how to code." And like one of the first responses they got was, "If you're asking this question, maybe you shouldn't be a programmer." And that's a very rude thing to say. And the person saying it, like they weren't trying to be rude. They weren't trying to scare them. But that's what happens. And a big part of it is because we don't know how we measure as programmers. There is always like this really good programmer uh, we look at and we judge ourselves compared to them. Like even today, like I, I do, I work on Node.js, and then I don't know, for example, the streams code very well. And if I look at the streams code, uh, I, I look at all these like really good developers who work on the streams code, and I feel inadequate. And that's very common in in like the industry and the culture. There is always this like very we, we perceive them as very uh, smart and competent developers. They don't perceive themselves as such, but we do. And we don't know how we measure. I can't tell you if I'm a six at JavaScript or a seven at JavaScript. That's not something we can accurately measure because it's a huge subject. And we don't have objective measures. And because it's moving so fast, there is a very good chance we never will. So back to Akinelito, why are we even here? Like, if we have this culture of, of fear, of scaring, of shaming, of calling people stupid in the industry and in the internet communities, why are we even here? Well, because building things is awesome. I think programming, and I, I think a lot of you will agree in a programming conference, is, is really fun. It's, you get to create things, and, and for me, that's amazing. I get to look at code and, and, and build things out of nothing, and for me, that, that's amazing. I start the creative process, and there are very few uh, professions, at least when I checked, that let you do that, that you get to build something and then people use it. Uh, and, and certainly, like, not a lot of professions that are as accessible, but this leads to gatekeeping because we keep telling people that programming is easy and you should get into programming and anyone can learn how to program. Well, it's a very problematic place to be in because we keep telling people that it's easy, you should program, uh, you should learn JavaScript in a week, you should learn C++, it's, it's just something you can do. And that leads to a lot of fear. Because you have these people who will tell you, hey, you do JavaScript? That's not really programming. You should do C++. And then you have people telling you, hey, you do C++? That's not really programming. You should do assembly. And you have people telling you, hey, you do Java, huh? Uh, maybe one day you'll be a real programmer. And that's a very scary thing to hear, because you don't know if those people know what they're talking about, and they might. So I, I see this very often, for example, with languages that are markup languages, like HTML and CSS, people hold very strong opinions about whether or not those are programming languages or they're like markup languages. And I'm wondering where those very strong opinions come from. And I want to say this out loud. Programming is not easy. Programming is amazing. It's fun. But it's not easy. It's actually quite hard. You get to solve hard problems. That's one of the like, reasons we like programming. Programming is frustrating. Uh, very frustrating. There is a lot of resistance. You end up hitting the wall very often. You start working on something, and then it doesn't work out. Like, you start a project, and you have this uh, very good idea of what you're going to do, and then you try doing it, and it doesn't work. And that happens all the time in programming. It's a fundamental part of our process. And it happens to me quite often, but we keep telling people that programming is easy. And we reward exploration. On one hand, we tell people, yeah, you should do things, you should explore, you should learn new things, which is great. But on the other hand, that, that's, that can send a bad message, where they start feeling inadequate when they can't understand stuff. And another big thing, and this is, by the way, an 81 out of 100. It's hard to see on the screen. And this is my real score for imposter syndrome. And it, it creates a very problematic culture where people internalize a fear out of not being adequate. I need to constantly remind myself that I am not an imposter. And it's something that's very pervasive in our industry. We train people to be like this because we keep telling them it's easy and we keep calling them stupid for doing like, things that are not what we are doing. Uh, and that's out of fear because if I do React and you do Angular, 
maybe it feels nicer for me uh, to think that React is the, is the right way. It's a lot easier to think that I have the answer than there are a lot of maybe good answers, and it's very hard to assess what's the right way forward. And another big place you see this is inclusivity. You have communities, like as someone who does open source, sometimes people actually do send you reports and, and telling you, hey, you used a gendered word, you used he. And I don't like that. I am, a, for example, I'm a female, and, and it doesn't make me feel welcome, and I want to get friends to work on the project. And people have very strong, and, and I just want to say this first, maintainers don't really uh, mind. Like, we just want people to w work on the projects we care about. If someone is bothered by a certain word or a phrase, we just change it. It's not a, it's not a, we want people to feel welcome. That's a lot more important for us. But sometimes people get very offended by this. You'd have discussions on, on Facebook and Reddit and all sorts of places where people have very strong opinions about using a certain word or a certain phrase. And those people are usually not a part of the project. And, and I think it's a very interesting phenomenon. And I think all of that is fear. Us telling people that their uh, project is stupid, that's fear. Us telling people that we feel very strongly about being able to use a certain word, like one word, that's fear. Us telling people that they should learn this certain technology that we happen to use, that's fear. But fear is scary, enough about fear. Let's do one step forward and talk about open source. So in the context of like the last few slides, the first thing I want to say about open source is you do not have to do open source. You really, really don't have to do open source. If you don't do open source, I promise you, like, nothing terrible would happen. There are a lot of talks telling you you need to do open source, open source is amazing, and open source is amazing. But in this culture of fear, uh, we need to remember that you don't have to do open source. And in the same context, you don't need to have side projects. You don't need to code at home. Those are things that I consider fun. But if, you're doing, don't, if you don't do them, that's fine. Maybe sometimes you're after a day of work and you just want to get home and relax, or you, have, or you like to paint, or you have other hobbies. That's absolutely fine. And, and don't let anyone shame you for this, because people will. People will tell you, hey, you don't, you don't have side projects? Maybe you're not an adequate programmer, like all the good programmers have side projects. I know amazing programmers that don't have a single side project. I know amazing programmers who don't do open source. It's not fair. To think, about, like, to think about yourself, maybe if I don't have side projects, I'm not a good programmer. And it's not a fair way to judge yourself. And I, I think it's, it's very common in our culture. But you remember the creative part? Do you remember the, why were we in here in the first place? Why were we in a, why were we in a programming conference? It's because we love programming. Programming is amazing. Like, you get to build cool things. That's, that's a creative process. There is a good community. There are a lot of, there's a lot of appeal to programming. So I want to talk, after I said very clearly, I hope, that you don't have to do open source, I want to talk a bit about what, why you sh should consider it. So let's talk about what open source can do for you. So first of all, you get to work with some really smart and really kind people, and this shocked me for the first few times. The first few times, I s interacted with projects. Like, for example, you, maybe you care about JavaScript, and you go to the JavaScript mailing list, and then suddenly, all those people you heard about who are writing the language, they will talk to you because they, they love it too, and, and they like talking about things they're passionate about. So it's, very, it's a very easy and accessible way to get to some of the smartest and kindest people I know. And it's, it's a very nice way uh, to, to get to people you thought are unreachable. And I, I remember thinking this. I remember thinking, like sitting in my home and thinking, those people, they won't want to talk to me. Like, who am I to, to talk to all these uh, people I, I read about and I care about that write all the important tech blogs or work on all the important, like to me, projects? And it turns out those people really like talking to you if you're into it. And you get to solve problems for hundreds of thousands of people. And I think this is hard to see. It's like download stats for some libraries uh, I'm involved in. And you really get to solve problems for a large crowd. You get to interact and help a lot of people. And for me, that's big. In this culture of fear, being able to help, at least in a little way, a lot of people is a great way to combat the fear and build self-worth. So, for example, I'd work on a library. And, like, for example, Bluebird. Uh, and I'll talk about Bluebird a little later. 
uh, I'd work on the library and then people would come and say thank you. And that gives you a lot of like, strength internally. And you get to close the world knowledge gap. And this is something a lot of people who work on open source really care about. Uh, basically, by building a technology that's accessible, that's not owned by a single company, and that everyone can use and modify, uh, you help people who are in places in the world that are not as fortunate. And those places don't have to be Africa, for example. There are people in Israel that don't have access to a lot of technology. And maybe for those people, like buying a server is expensive. And if you can make it a little bit more accessible for them, uh, I, I think it can have a lot of impact. And you learn new things. So th this is a big one for me, uh, because in this culture of, of fear, of shaming, uh, being able to like, have your head over the water and, and, and being able to basically always uh, be at least a little familiar with new things, with new technology, uh, is a great motivator. And you learn them in depth. So very often, I start working on something, and I think I understand it. And then like two years later, the, the biggest thing I learned is that I don't understand it. So for, for me, for example, that's asynchronous primitives in JavaScript. It's something I thought I had the answer to a few years ago, and now I know I don't have the answer to and how complicated it is. Another big one is that you learn that everyone is facing the struggle. So when I started engaging with Node working groups in Node.js, I expected that the common factor for those people would be, for example, that they have side projects, or that they know all the new programming languages, that they know, I don't know, Rust and Go and Clojure and like a bunch of new programming languages. It's not it. Those people have pets, and those people do meditation. Those are the two biggest like, uniting factors for, for people uh, that I consider successful in the industry that I interacted with. So you learn that not everyone is so obsessed with uh, like being, uh, being OK with like, side projects and, and open source. A lot of them are like, learned and, and taught me, and I'm grateful for this, uh, self-care techniques. And that's important. And you learn that if you start including people and they start including you, if you don't hold such strong opinions about who should contribute, and you start engaging with the people and they engage with you, it's not that like, uh, you learn, basically, that a lot of the, the technology, and, and this took me forever to get. I used to think it's all about the tech, it's all about the tech. The tech is written by people. It's people at the end of the day who write the technology. The reason, like, it takes no a while to ship, I don't know, for example, something we shipped recently, threads, uh, isn't because of the technical know-how. It's because you need people to engage and work on it and stick with it. So you learn that when those people include you and you include them, it's the technology that benefits at the end of the day. And if you, hold, if you don't hold such strong opinions about what a contributor should look like, then it's the technology that benefits a lot from it. And Obviously, you also improve your skills because you literally have people uh, who have been doing this a lot review your code. You have people who wrote books, you have people who you look up to. And it, it really helps you improve your skills. Uh, you, you get a lot better at code review, you get a lot better at writing code maybe. And this is especially useful for your technology. So for example, if you want to get into Rust, then there are a lot of open source projects that you can start in. And I'll talk a bit about how to start in uh, open source projects later. And it comments the fear. Uh, because when I feel like I'm an imposter, when I have these doubts that a lot of, I, I guess a lot of us have, I talk to other collaborators. And they don't tell me, hey, you're a good programmer. What they tell me is, we have those doubts too. And it's real. And we are in a culture of fear. Because communities can battle the fear together. When you're a part of a community, when there is a bigger hole, uh, you can basically combat the fear with them uh, through understanding. Now, I want to give a personal example about JavaScript. We had this big debate a few years ago about callbacks versus promises. And today, promises are very popular and callbacks are falling out of fashion. Uh, when we do surveys, uh, like around 90 plus percent of the people use promises and a sync await, which I am a fan of. So obviously, uh, as a fan of promises, in 2012, I held a very strong opinion uh, that promises are the wrong way forward. 
I told people promises are the wrong way forward, we should do callbacks, promises are stupid. Uh, if you do promises, you're not understanding it. And I was just scared. I, I, I did not understand promises very well, and I held a very strong opinion uh, that you shouldn't use promises. And then I went to Finland, and I met Petka, who is a friend, and uh, we sat together, and he, uh, he gave me a rant about why promise libraries are slow, and we talked a lot, and like, uh, the second time I saw him, he had a prototype of Bluebird. And uh, we, we did a lot of work, of API work, uh, on Bluebird in the coming years. So uh, obviously I learned my lesson, and it taught me that like, I was wrong, and like, there's a lot of valid opinions that are worth throwing out. Well, that's not what happened at all. Obviously, what I did uh, after meeting with Petka is start telling people promises are the only way forward, if you use callbacks, you are doing it wrong. And that's a terrible thing to say, and I understand it now. And arguing with people about it never works, because when you argue with people uh, about something as fundamental as like the asynchronous primitive or the framework you use, you're both scared. You're both, you're both scared that you have it wrong, because no one is really sure if you have it wrong or you don't have it wrong, or you have it right. Uh, so nothing good ever came out of arguing with people about it. Now, I, I want to talk about what did work. What worked is being positive and teaching people about promises. Like, uh, I had a year, I think it was 2015 or 14, where I went on Stack Overflow and I answered every single promise question I could find. I answered, I think, 800 questions about promises. And compared to arguing with people, which just drained me and scared me, uh, answering questions and talking to people and giving talks, that gave me strength and that helped the platform. Uh, and, and this guy, Bergy, like, he got it. He, he never got into the arguments, and he just answered the questions, so props for him uh, for understanding it way, way before I did. And the sad part is that when you have this culture of fear, when you have all these strong arguments, it drives people away. Uh, I had a lot of smart people telling me, I will not engage in this discussion anymore. This discussion is unhealthy for me. I feel a real impact on my mental health. And that's a very scary thing to hear. When someone you care about tells you, I I'm out, I'm feeling that my, my health is at stake here. That's not something you want to hear. And that's a very scary message to get. So wh when we do this, when we tell people we have the only way forward, what we're actually doing is this. We're driving away a lot of the talented people who would otherwise engage. And, and we should stop. Just to be clear, I'm, I'm not happy and I'm not proud of the way I conducted myself in 2014. Uh, so we had, uh, we had this, and I want to talk about how to get into open source, because there is a lot of talks and a lot of information of like, how to open your first pull request. But to be honest, I don't think anyone here uh, who doesn't do open source or doesn't do as much open source as they like uh, is stuck on the how do I open a pull request or how do I use Git issue. Because if you haven't used Git, Git is scary, but you learn Git. It's the tool. And if you haven't, done a, if you haven't opened a pull request, that's like a technical know-how you can learn. Uh, so I think a lot of time it's because people don't know how to start. They don't know what, what issue to start with. So you start by finding projects with technology you care about, and probably already is. So if you're a web developer, maybe that's ESLint, maybe that's Webpack, maybe that's Firefox, maybe that's Node. Uh, and you find these projects you already use. It's better if it's projects you care a lot about. So if, for example, you use Webpack, but you hate Webpack, that can either be a good thing, because hate comes from caring. If you don't care about something, you don't hate it. Or it can be a bad thing. You don't like the community or the people. Uh, so start with finding projects you care about, and then approach the people working on them and ask. Seriously, if I had one slide for this talk, this would be it. Instead of starting to do mind reading and starting to think about whether they like my contribution or they think my contribution is bad, what you want to do is approach the people and just ask them. Because collaborators, people who work on open source projects, they want to talk to you. They really want other people who are passionate about the projects they care about. And you can tell them, hey, I'm not sure if my JavaScript is good or my Python is good. I think it's OK. And I can commit uh, four hours or six hours or eight hours. And maybe they'll tell you, well, there's nothing you can do with that amount of time. Uh, or they tell you, hey, I have this really cool thing you can work on. 
So the easiest way is to make it their problem, to make it our problem, and just ask. And I promise you that I will answer like every single email I will get. I don't promise you that anyone will make a, a meaningful contribution or a good contribution, but I will promise you a discussion. And, and another thing is that if you don't want to ask, because asking is scary, it's reaching out to someone you might be scared of or respect a lot. Uh, there is usually a file called contributing.md that outlines the process for contribution. But this should only be a second option, uh, because talking to people and communication usually just, in my experience, works a lot better. Another big thing is that a lot of people have this idea in their head that maybe they are not smart enough for open source. Maybe they are not a good enough developer in a certain language or technology for open source. Maybe they are not a good enough engineer for open source because maybe they had a negative experience or someone called them stupid. Don't do this. It's a very unfair thing to do to yourself. I do it to myself often, and I'm trying to be very uh, conscious about it. Because maybe you go into Node and you tell yourself, maybe I'm not good enough for working on Node.js. And that's usually not the case. Usually when people uh, judge themselves this way, it's not justified. Uh, because it's very unfair to think you're either very good or very bad at something if you haven't tried it a few times. Like, sometimes people will open a single pull request that, that doesn't go through, and uh, they'll be disappointed to say, hey, maybe I don't understand this, I'm not good enough. And that's usually not the case. Like, I think maybe three out of five or four out of five pull requests I make get closed because they're either not good enough or they're good enough and like, the, there is no, uh, there is no uh, incentive to make the change or th like, I understood the problem better after having a discussion. So it's, remember imposter syndrome, remember like, the struggle, and be kind to yourself. Like, try to set up a plan, maybe I'll do it eight times and stick with it. So that's about open source. I want to talk about self-efficacy. So that's the third uh, topic of today's talk. And self-efficacy is essentially an in, like, our belief in our own competence in a certain field. And self-efficacy is really important. It's basically how much we believe uh, we can achieve our goals. And the first thing I want to say about self-efficacy, and I might be getting all of this wrong, I have no training as a therapist or a psychologist or anything like that. This is just my curiosity on the internet and lectures I, I took. So self-efficacy is trainable. It's something you can work on. It's not something you are born with. You're not born with the ability to believe uh, you can contribute to Linux. It's something you can train. So, a few words about Makshimim. Makshimim is a program for high school students uh, where uh, they, they learn uh, coding for three hours. We call it cyber because that's, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, it's a, exactly, yeah. So, it's a, it's a program where, uh, where kids learn how to, how to uh, code for three hours twice, uh, like, uh, twice a week for three years. And it's a very nice program, because one of the first things I learned in Makshimim, and I'm very grateful for this, is that it doesn't actually matter very much if the, if like the uh, people, like the kids, know how to write C++ at the end of the day. Like, I teach them C++ and object-oriented, we call it advanced programming, uh, for a year. And at the end of the year, I don't actually care if they know C++. What I care about is whether or not they develop self-efficacy. Because self-efficacy is a good predictor for curiosity, for whether or not they'll go and work on uh, side projects at the end of the year, or whether, whether or not they'll try new things, whether or not they'll engage. Because you want to develop this curiosity and this self-efficacy and this I, I can try attitude in people. And that's very important. Because low self-efficacy leads to belief that things are harder than they actually are. There is, if anyone cares, there is uh, a lot of research I cited in the slides, and I will, I will make the slides available. Uh, and there is a lot of really good research I looked into about this. And low self-efficacy, low belief in your own competence, leads to actual belief that things are harder than they actually are. You assess them as harder. You look at open source and you think, hey, maybe, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe like opening a pull request is hard. And high self-efficacy leads to not blaming your own ability. High self-efficacy leads to thinking that, hey, maybe this external factor, or maybe I just, I, I wasn't lucky, 
or maybe this particular pull request wasn't good, but the next one I'll do will, will do fine. And people with high self-efficacy undertake more tasks, and they undertake more challenging tasks, and they try more. And remember, it's trainable. And consider training your self-efficacy, because your self-efficacy is trainable, and open source can be a great way to train self-efficacy. And it's a great way to come out of fear, because when you develop self-efficacy, you, you develop this great, I don't know, personality tool to, to combat this imposter syndrome that's so pervasive. Now, I want to talk about Node.js and fear for a few minutes. So Node.js is an open source project. Uh, a lot of you might have heard of it. And Node.js is committed to be safe for people who want in. We, we won't guarantee you will make a meaningful contribution. Uh, we won't guarantee uh, you'll do awesome or you'll have fun. We do guarantee, uh, and I'm saying this with my uh, Node.js moderation hat, uh, that we will do our best uh, to make sure no one will call you stupid. Or if you ask a question that is maybe you think is trivial, it's, it's usually, usually when people have trivial questions, it's actually really hard and good questions. But uh, if you ask questions, we won't make fun of you. And it's a place people can contribute in. It's a place you can contribute in. Of course, it didn't used to be this way. When I started with Node.js, it was very toxic. Like, I remember my first interaction in Node.js, and basically people called me stupid and told me it's not the right way forward. I think it was related to promises. Uh, it wasn't a fun experience. Uh, and it took time. It took time and it took a lot of uh, people I, I, I really appreciate uh, to take the time and build a culture where people can contribute in. And I think a big part of it is the way decisions are made, because Node.js uses something called the consensus-seeking model, uh, which means decisions aren't, aren't sometimes as fast and uh, not really as uh, like decisive often, and change is harder to make, but it ensures that uh, everyone is heard. So if you have an opinion, we, maybe you won't do what you, what you want, but we will listen. And I think in retrospect, looking at the consensus-seeking model three years for, now, like for three years now, it has prevented a lot of really bad calls from being made. And finally, I want to give some tips for open source. And I'm going to start with a really big one. So the, the first and most important tip is to always assume good faith. You, you won't imagine how many times people assume other people are trolling them or are acting in bad faith or are just trying to be annoying. It's very rarely the case. It's very rare for people to go into open source projects and try to troll them. And usually when they do it, it's, it's very clear cut. You can tell. Usually when someone is trolling, uh, they're just scared. They, they will uh, make an, open an issue and suggest something, and then when they get shut down, they say, no, actually, I was trolling. I, I, I wasn't serious, I was just trolling, haha. -ha. And if you cause someone to do that, th that's a very bad place to be in, because you really want to assume good faith and that people are interacting in good faith with you, and that's a really big one, because in open source projects that do this, contributions are so much easier. And you need to be empathic. You don't have to be empathic, but it really helps. Because when you talk to someone, it's very easy to uh, devolve the conversation to winning, to me versus you, and not our shared goal and what we both want to get. And when you're empathic, when you try to understand when the other person is coming from, it helps you with the fear, because you see that the other person is in a similar situation, and it helps them with the fear. And you should chase what motivates you. Don't work on projects you don't care about. If you start, like, if you make a pull request to Node and that bores you, or you had a bad experience, don't contribute to Node. We are in this wonderful, exciting time where there is a lot of open source and a lot of open source projects. And the open source projects uh, can benefit a lot from people and their interactions. One thing you should consider trying is public speaking. Uh, especially if it scares you. Now, public speaking is scary. I know this because I'm scared right now. It's a scary thing to do. I, I, it was a lot scarier the first 10 times, uh, but it's very scary. And uh, it's, it's something you can work on. Like, uh, this conference, for example, uh, does a public speaking workshop, which is great. Uh, a lot of the teams, uh, I see a meet here uh, with JavaScript Isabel. Hi, he's also in reverse sim, and he helps people with that. And 
If you want to do public speaking and you're scared, maybe I don't have something smart enough to say, maybe I don't have something important enough to say, uh, talk to these people. Like, maybe reach out and ask. Because public speaking is fun. It's a great way to meet people and to get engaged in the community. And stick with it. If you think, I will make a pull request to Node.js, and it will work out on the first time, you are not being kind to yourself, and you are setting yourself up to disappointment, because it's hard. People will tell you, yeah, you should like, contribute to Angular. It's easy. It's not easy. It's something you need to stick with, and you need to set an amount of time. Like Maybe you want to set eight sessions of three hours and commit to that and try. Because it's very easy to not try things because you're afraid uh, you won't do so well. I, I do this all the time. So it's very important to stick with it uh, and be fair to yourself and belong to a community because communities come at the fear together. Run away from poisonous people. Every now and then you will see someone and they will be, they'll make a very strong argument against something or for something. And that can be very scary. You don't have to put up with it. We have a lot of projects. The projects are interesting. They will do their best to come at the fear with you. And if you run into this, just run, really. It's not worth your time, it's not worth your mental energy. And make friends with the fear, because hard things uh, get scary. It will get scary. When you talk with people you appreciate, when you talk about uh, things you care about, it gets scary, because fear comes from caring. And practice self-compassion. Accomplishments in our field come from hard work. They don't come from extreme talent or being uh, very smart. And that also took me a lot of time to understand because I talked to these really smart people and they'd, they'd like uh, tell me, yeah, I, I'm, like, don't call me smart. When you call me smart, you're belittling the fact I had to actually put a thousand hours into this. So be self-compassionate. And, and a trick I learned that helps me with this is when people talk to you uh, and you're, you're judging yourself, think about what you would tell a friend. If you had a friend in this situation, uh, for example, that opened a pull request and it didn't go through, what would you tell them? Practice this, it's important. If anyone wants to contribute uh, to Node.js, this is my email. It's also available in Node.js slash Node, that's the main Node repository, and you're welcome to send me an email. Again, I don't promise anyone meaningful contribution, I do promise you a discussion. And uh, I work at Peer5, it's an awesome company. If anyone wants to build uh, a peer-to-peer -peer CDN on top of WebRTC, I'd love it if you uh, sent an email. Thank you.